Now, derm is one of those topics that most medical schools really don't do a good job of covering. Dermatology is a very complex field. Rashes tend to look the same. There's very interesting and unique buzzwords, but some of the buzzwords overlap. So it can be a really confusing topic for a lot of medical students. What I've done is I've taken all of the dermatology that's fair game for boards, and I've boiled it down into five different categories. And the way that I categorize these, and these are totally uh, arbitrary and just how I like to keep it in my head, is as such. So I have five categories here. I have the erythema category, the neoplasm or cancer category, random because it doesn't fit into the other ones, the dermatitis category, and the positive Nikolsky category. And let's go through these one at a time and I'll tell you what we're going to talk about in each of the categories. So with the erythema category, we're going to talk about erythema nodosum, erythema multiforme, and dermatitis herpetiformis. In the neoplasm category, we're going to talk about basal cell carcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma, melanoma, and actinic keratosis. In my random category, I have pityriasis rosea. I'm butchering that name completely, but whatever. Lichen planus and psoriasis. In the dermatitis category, we have seborrheic dermatitis, atopic dermatitis, also known as allergic dermatitis, and contact dermatitis. And then in my positive Nikolsky category, we have pemphigus vulgaris, Steven Johnson syndrome slash toxic epidermic necrolysis and staphylococcal scalded skin syndrome, AKA SSSS. So these are how I'm gonna categorize everything. We're gonna talk about every disease process that you see here on the slide. If you're wondering where a certain topic is that you think belongs in the derm section but isn't on this slide, well then I have news for you, I'm not gonna cover it. This is the high yield stuff, the stuff that you're probably gonna see on your exam. Of course there's more dermatology that's fair game to show up, but it's not as high yield as what you see right here. So this is what we're talking about today, and for everything else, go crack open your boring ass first aid book that you spent way too much money on, and enjoy the free video brought to you by Dirty USMLE. Please sign up on our Patreon account. Anyway, let's get started. So the first thing we're gonna talk about is the erythema category. So we have erythema nodosum, erythema multiforme, and dermatitis herpetiformis. So how I'm gonna do all these slides is I'm gonna show you pictures, we're gonna talk about the associations, we're gonna talk about the buzzwords, we're gonna talk about the treatment, all that good stuff, everything you need to know and nothing more. So here are the picks. Um, a is association and B is buzzword. So let's talk about that because that's where the test writers are gonna go. So the associations of all of these three erythemas are really, really high yield. So for erythema nodosum, you should know that it's associated with sarcoidosis and inflammatory bowel disease, right? So Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. The buzzword or the location, if you will, is gonna be pretibial. So in erythema nodosum, patients gonna have sarcoidosis or one of the inflammatory bowel diseases, and all of a sudden they're gonna develop these kind of red, diffusely painful erythematous lesions in the pretibial area of their legs. If you see that, the answer is erythema nodosum. Erythema multiforme is associated mostly with herpes simplex virus, but also a little bit with mycoplasma. So I would really pay attention to HSV, although you do get it with mycoplasma pneumoniae. Um, the buzzword here is that it's gonna be on the palms. It can also be on the chest, but most of the time they're gonna give you a patient who has a history of herpes. All of a sudden they have this rash on the palms. Uh, if they look like that, or it's a patient with herpes who all of a sudden gets a rash, the answer is erythema multiforme. It can also be on the chest or the center of the chest or the center of the back, but most of the time it's gonna be on the palms. Dermatitis herpetiformis is associated with celiac disease, and a lot of times test writers, they're not really even going to touch on the abdominal complaint associated with celiac, but they'll give you this rash, and be, it, it, the answer is going to be that they have celiac disease. So the reason that it's called herpetiformis is because it looks like herpes, right? Herpetiformis. It looks like herpet or herpes. Okay, so it's gonna be described the same way that herpes simplex virus is described. It's gonna be vesicles with, in multiple stages of healing. Some are gonna be crusted, some are gonna be ulcering. It's even gonna look like HSV. So you're gonna have a tough time with your differential when you see this picture. But if you have a patient who is in that kind of autoimmune category, so maybe like a 20 to 40 year old female, male, diffuse abdominal pain, whatever, can't eat gluten, they have a rash, it's dermatitis herpetiformis. So know the associations because that's where they'll go with this erythema category. Again, erythema nodosum, sarcoidosis, or inflammatory bowel disease, it's gonna be on the legs. Erythema multiforme, most of the time herpes, rarely mycoplasma, it's gonna be on the palms. Dermatitis herpetiformis, celiac disease, could be anywhere, gonna look like herpes, but it's not herpes. 
Now let's talk about the treatment. So erythema nodosum, you treat the underlying disease. So if it's sarcoidosis or if it's inflammatory bowel disease, you treat those two diseases, this rash will go away. Erythema multiforme, give them steroids. Dermatitis or pediformis, give them Dapsone. Memorize Dapsone for whatever reason, it's a really high yield one they love to ask about. They'll give you, they'll show you the blunted villi or whatever, show you the rash, what's the treatment for the rash? The answer is Dapsone. So those are my erythemas. How are we gonna remember this? My mnemonic for these are nodes on the knees, forms below the fingers, and the herpet enormous imposter. So nodes on the knees, nodosum, nodes on the knees. Multiforme, so forms below the fingers. So again, it's gonna be on the hands, it's gonna be on the palms. And then instead of herpetiformis, I want you to think herpet enormous imposter because this is the herpes imposter. Looks a lot like herpes, but mm -mm, it's fake and it's just dermatitis herpetiformis. So those are the erythemas. Let's move on now to the neoplasm, AKA cancerous category. So in this category, let's start with our three cancers. So we have basal cell, squamous cell, and melanoma. Guys, I got news for you. The rash is gonna be in a sun exposed area. So that don't tell you shit. You see sun exposed area on the exam, you might as well throw your arms up in the air, look around the test center and be like, fuck, I don't know. It's not gonna tell you anything. You have to get these questions right based on what the rash looks like and what the buzzwords that they give you are. So let's start with the picks. Basal cell carcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma, and melanoma. That's what they look like. Your mileage might vary a little bit, but it's always gonna look like this most of the time. So let's talk about how they're going to eloquently describe this. So basal cell carcinoma is a pearly dome-shaped rolled border central ulceration with telangiectasia, okay? So look at the picture. It's pearly, it's dome-shaped, has rolled borders, might have central ulceration, that's like a plus or minus there, with telangiectasia. Telangiectasia is the big one. If you see little blood vessels growing in this smooth, pearly looking, pink, rolled, bean looking lesion, that's basal cell carcinoma. Squamous cell carcinoma is going to look really disgusting. It's gonna be scarred, it's gonna be crusted, it's gonna be ulcerated, it's gonna be poorly defined with yellow or white scaling. So the way that I think about this is basal cell looks like a nice, soft little bean. Squamous, looks like an ugly motherfucker. Look at that thing, it's ugly, right? It's scaling, it's ulcerated, it's crusty, it's ugly. Squamous cell is ugly, okay? Basal cell, rolled, has a little blood vessel, has telangiectasia, but squamous cell is crusted and gross. Melanoma is 100% of the time gonna look like what you see on my slide. It's going to be a pigmented, multicolored, irregular brownish lesion with blurred margins. So if you see that, where there's like really dark brown in one spot and then like a little lighter brown elsewhere, but the, it's asymmetric, it's, it, looks, it just doesn't look right because the colors are different and the size of it is different and some areas are a little bit more raised than others. That's what melanoma looks like. Now, it's basically a freckle that's gone bad. So that's melanoma. Now, these are your descriptions. These are what the lesions are always gonna look like. Let's talk on something that's really high yield, and that's gonna be how do you treat these. So the reason I wanna have this conversation is because especially for basal cell carcinoma, the treatment's really, really high yield. So for basal cell carcinoma, you use electrodecation with curatage or Mohs microsurgery. And how do you make that distinction of which one you're supposed to choose? Well, if the basal cell carcinoma is located in what I'll call a very, very sensitive spot, such as on the face or in an area that's re really not conducive to um, the other means of removing it, you have to use Mohs microsurgery. So Mohs microsurgery is for when the basal cell carcinoma is in an area of the body that you just cannot afford to do a more in-depth surgical procedure to remove it on. That's why Mohs microsurgery has really gained popularity in dermatology. So Mohs microsurgery, when it's in a small sensitive spot, so really hone in on that micro term. That's why that conversation is really high yield. For both squamous cell carcinoma and melanoma, you do surgical excision. It's really important to take that puppy out of there because these things can be very malignant if they are not removed promptly, especially melanoma. The other thing I wanna talk about is the disease process that you haven't seen yet on these slides, and that's actinic keratosis. So basically, actinic keratosis is going to look sort of similar to squamous cell carcinoma, but I'll say not as bad. It's gonna look more of like a, just a regular sort of scabby lesion on the face that's gonna be described as a sandpaper lesion. And the, the purposes of this discussion is that if you don't treat the actinic keratosis, it can progress to a squamous cell carcinoma. So it's considered a pre-malignant or pre-cancerous lesion, and that's why it's really, really high yield on boards. So that's actinic keratosis. But these are the four disease processes for our neoplasm category. 
Okay, so now let's get back to this slide and talk about the mnemonic for remembering these. So the basal cell carcinoma, I think of the basal bean. For squamous cell, I think of the squamous scar. And for the melanoma, I think of the melanoma minor. So I'm keeping the letters consistent here. So let's look at this. Basal cell carcinoma looks like a really nice, smooth bean. Squamous scar, it looks like a nasty scar. And the melanoma minor, the reason that that's the mnemonic is because, and this is very high yield. On boards, they're going to ask you to what is the most important prognostic factor regarding a melanoma, and the answer is the depth of invasion. So how far down into the skin that melanoma goes is the most important prognostic indicator. That is to say that the deeper the melanoma goes into the skin, the, the worse the prognosis. So I think of the melanoma minor because the more he digs into the ground, the more dangerous he's, his life is more at risk, the more further down under the ground our miner goes. And also, look at all that nasty brown stuff on the miner's face. Kind of looks like the nasty brown discoloration of a melanoma. So the basal bean, the squamous scar, and the melanoma miner reminding us that the depth of invasion determines the prognosis for melanoma. So that's the neoplasm category. Let's talk about random, okay? Random category. First up, Pateriaus rosea, lichen planus, and psoriasis. So here are your pictures. Petar Pateriasis rosea. I'm never going to say that correctly. Sorry, guys. Lichen planus and psoriasis. So let's talk about the descriptions here. So for PR, because I'm done butchering that name, it's going to be a herald patch with a later eruption on the trunk in a Christmas tree pattern. Now, I'm being really generous with these buzzwords. They're probably not going to give you the words herald patch or Christmas tree on your test. And we'll talk about that in just a second. Lichen planus is going to be purple, polygonal, planar, paritic, plaques, and papules. So the P's, guys, high yield, the P's, purple, polygonal, planar, paritic, plaques, and papules. At the very least on your exam, they'll give you purple. You see purple? You're, you're, we're talking like in plainness. And for psoriasis, it's going to be silvery scales on the extensor surfaces that bleed when they are scraped. So these are our descriptors. Now let's talk about some really, really high yield things that you should know about these three dermatologic processes. So, so for Pateriaus rosea, think of the single lesion. So this rash will always start as a single lesion. And you're going to see this referred to in first aid and other texts as the herald patch. I don't know why the hell they call it a herald patch, but it starts as one larger lesion. If you look up in that picture, you can see on the right side of this patient's rib cage, they have one large lesion. And then later, sometimes within two weeks, that will um, de develop into smaller lesions that distribute in a Christmas tree pattern. So they go down the trunk, they go down the back in a Christmas tree distribution. So it starts as a single large lesion, develops into several smaller lesions, and it goes down and spreads down through the trunk on the front and the back. So that's Pateriasis rosea. Starts as your single herald patch, goes down into a Christmas tree distribution. For lichen planus, aside from having to know those, all those words that begin with the letter P, you should really be familiar with these oral white lesions in the mouth, and they're called Wickham striae. So you see white linear lesions on the tongue or the sides of the mouth with a purple rash elsewhere? Think Wickham striae and think lichen planus. So there are a lot of different diseases that can manifest with oral lesions, right? We know that with Crohn's you can get that, you can get that with Kawasaki disease, you can get that with Bichette's disease, but if you only have lichen planus as a choice on your tests, the answer is lichen planus because they're showing you Wickham striae. So large differential, but if you see purple whatever plus the oral lesions, they're telling you that it's lichen planus. For psoriasis, I want you to remember two things. First, the auspitz sign. So with psoriasis, if you scrape the lesion off, you'll see pinpoint bleeding. That is auspitz sign. Very, very high yield for psoriasis. The other is don't forget psoriasis's association with the HLA B27 diseases. So if you see psoriasis or you see auspitz sign, maybe they'll say, what else is the patient at risk for? It's going to be your HLA B27s. So that's my random category, and we'll wrap that one up by talking about the treatments. So for PR, you do emollients. That's to say there really is no treatment. So, you know, put a little cream on that bad boy, call it a day. Lichen planus and psoriasis both get steroids because they are inflammatory processes. Okay, so really no treatment, supportive, emollient care for PR, but lichen planus and psoriasis, you got to treat with steroids. Mnemonic time. How do we remember these? Well, I told you that for Pateriaus rosea, it is a single lesion that goes down and develops in a Christmas tree pattern. So, no surprise, we're going to use the Christmas tree. So, look at the top of the Christmas tree. We have our single bigger ornament that then goes down, and then throughout the tree as you go down, you see smaller ornaments that mimics 
Petarius Rosius, or remember the PR Christmas tree. For lichen planus, I want you to, instead of lichen planus, think lichen purple or lichen purple. So lick reminds me that you're going to get the Wickham striae in the, in the tongue or in the mouth. And purple reminds me, instead of planus, that we're talking about purple lesions. And they should really give that to you on your exam. So instead of lichen planus, I think lichen purple. Instead of petirius rosea, I think of my petirius Christmas tree. And for psoriasis, I don't have a mnemonic. It's kind of easy to see. It's always going to be on the extensor surface. So just don't forget that. Let's talk about the dermatitis category. Admittedly, this is probably the easiest category of the five. You have atopic dermatitis, AKA allergic dermatitis. You have contact dermatitis and seborrheic dermatitis. So here are your pictures. Um, atopic or allergic dermatitis really doesn't look too unique. It's just gonna be red looking. Contact dermatitis um, it has this sort of linear pattern to it and I'll get more into that. And seborrheic dermatitis is always gonna be around the margins of the scalp or around the face. So let's talk about these. These all have another name. Allergic dermatitis is also known as eczema. Contact dermatitis is poison ivy and seborrheic dermatitis is cradle cap, AKA dandruff. So let's talk about how these are described. Uh, diffuse, poorly demarcated, pyritic erythematous plaques with excoriation. If you know what these words mean, that's a pretty vague statement, right? So diffuse, widespread, poorly demarcated, doesn't look like anything, pyritic, itchy, erythematous, red, plaques, yeah, with excoriation. So doesn't really look like anything. Contact dermatitis is described as a linear or geometric papule or vesicle with scaling fissuring or lichenification. So basically on contact dermatitis, I told you this is poison ivy. It's a hypersensitivity reaction that occurs when something strikes your skin, such as the poison ivy plant. So normally the rash will be in a linear or geometric distribution based on whatever the offending thing was that touched the skin. So like if a leaf touches the skin, you'll see the linear rash where the leaf touched the skin. So it's a very specific pattern. If it was some type of metal necklace, you'll have a rash that looks like it's a necklace because it, the skin is only erupting where the item touched the skin, so it follows the geometric shape of the item. So that's the rash in a very you know geometric pattern is contact dermatitis. Seborrheic dermatitis is going to be that greasy, flaky skin on the scalp margins because this is cradle cap, and that's a very common thing in children. This is what causes dandruff. This is the reason that Head and Shoulders is a multinational fucking shampoo company because it is made with things that get rid of dandruff because everybody gets dandruff, ever everybody gets seborrheic dermatitis. So. Um, a little bit of fungus never hurt nobody. So what are the treatments for atopic dermatitis and contact dermatitis? Really emollient is the first step. So put a little cream on there, try to get the itching to go away. If it doesn't go away, you can use steroids, but most of the time it's a self-limiting process. For seborrheic dermatitis, you always treat with selenium sulfide shampoo. It's a little bit of antifungal action to get rid of that dandruff, uh, get rid of the cradle cap. Um, it's a very benign disease process that looks a lot worse than it actually is, but look for that flaky kind of yellow crust on a baby's face. That's going to be seborrheic dermatitis. So um, no mnemonics here, guys. These are easy to remember. So the allergic dermatitis is going to be in somebody with a history of atopy. So right, the, they're going to have asthma, they're going to have allergies, whatever, they're going to get this rash. Contact is based on something contacts you, really not hard to remember. And seborrheic dermatitis is going to be your cradle cap dandruff. So treat with selenium sulfide shampoo. Last category we need to talk about is the Nikolsky category. So let's start by talking about what the Nikolsky sign is and everything will make a lot more sense. So Nikolsky sign is that when you rub the skin, the skin is going to literally rub off. It's kind of gross, quite frankly. Um, you rub the skin and the skin just completely sloughs right off. That is a Nikolsky sign. So all of these diseases, it should not surprise you, pemphigus vulgaris, Steven Johnson syndrome slash toxic epidermal uh, necrolysis, and our 4S staphylococcal scalded skin syndrome, all of them are gonna have a positive Nikolsky sign. So all of them are gonna look really, really nasty. You see a picture of it, it's gonna look pretty bad. So here's what we got. These all look pretty bad, right? Um, let's talk about the high yields and what sets them apart because they're all gonna look nasty. They're all gonna have a positive Nikolsky sign on test day. So pemphigus vulgaris is caused by IgG against desmoglein. You're commonly going to see mucosal involvement. So if you have a positive Nikolsky sign with a really nasty rash and involvement of the oral cavity, it's pemphigus vulgaris. Steven Johnson syndrome slash toxic epidermal necrolysis is associated classically with drugs. So patient will have taken a drug for some other condition, 
Um, maybe they were sick and were on an antibiotic. Maybe they have um, some type of neurologic or psychiatric disease and they were on carbamazepine or lamotrigine. All of a sudden, they've got this terrible rash. Um, classically, it's associated with sulfonamides, carbamazepine, lamotrigine. can be uh, occasionally associated with cephalosporins or penicillins, but on test day, they'll usually give you one of these three. That's going to be SJS slash 10, and we'll talk about what the difference is between those diseases in just a second. For staphylococcal scalded skin syndrome, this is going to be usually in younger patients. It's caused by the staphylococcus exfoliative toxin. Look for a child with a history of recent infection, and then all of a sudden they develop this terrible rash with a positive Nikolsky sign. That's going to be SSSS. So let's talk about treatment. Treatment for pemphigus vulgaris is going to be steroids, right? It's, a, it's an autoimmune process, right? IgG against desmoglein. So no surprise, treat it with steroids. SJS slash 10, you just DC the um, offending agent. So if they are taking carbamazepine and all of a sudden they have this rash, just stop car carbamazepine. And then usually it's self-resolving after that, so supportive care. Patients who have really diffuse involvement, if they have toxic epidermal necrolysis, again, we'll, we'll talk about the differences in just a second, they might have to go to the ICU, but discontinue the drug is going to be the answer. And then for staphylococcal scalded skin syndrome, it's in the name. It's staphylococcal, so it, you treat staph. You give IV vanc. Now let's talk about a couple high yields that you should remember. Pemphigus vulgaris has something very similar to it called bullous pemphigoid. And basically bullous pemphigoid has a very similar presentation and the difference is that bullous pemphigoid does not have a positive Nikolsky sign. It's also due to a slightly different pathophysiology. Google that on your own time. I'm not gonna talk about that now. But the way that I remember that pemphigus vulgaris has Nikolsky sign positive and is way worse than bullous pemphigoid is vulgaris. So it's very vulgar, right? It's a lot more bad. It's more inflammatory. It's more vulgar. So pemphigus vulgaris has vulgar in the name. So I know it's going to be bad compared to bullous pemphigoid. Um, for SJS slash 10, let's talk about the differences. So Steven Johnson syndrome, the rash will affect less than 10% of the body surface. Whereas in toxic epidermal necrolysis, it will involve more than 30% of the body surface. So how do you remember that? The way that I remember this is some ridiculous mnemonic that I made. And I say, SJS is San Jose and 10 is Tennessee. And between San Jose and Tennessee, which city has more country music fans, San Jose or Tennessee? Well, in San Jose, less than 10% of that city is going to like country music. But in Tennessee, more than 30% of Tennessee is going to like country music because Nashville is the, the country capital of the United States. So that's my really dumb mnemonic, but it works. And then for SSSS, I remember four S's in a four-year-old because you're going to look for that young patient with a recent infection who has a poor immune system and then developed this really terrible inflammatory condition. But here are the mnemonics. And then for vulgaris, remember vulgar is worse than bullous pemphigoid because it has vulgar in the name. But that's it, guys. We just touched on all of these dermatologic things that are bound to show up on USMLE and Comlex. They're only hard because the rash pictures can throw you off and the, the buzzwords might sound the same, but if you remember the associations, you remember my dumb mnemonics, you're bound to get some free points on test day. I really hope this was useful. And please don't forget to check out the description of this video and support us on Patreon. It keeps us going and there are more videos to come.